Do you live your life a quarter mile at a time? Well, if you do, then you might understand why the Fast and the Furious has achieved 40 for 40. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm John Stark from MacMovieGuy.com. I'm a blind film critic, and I also turned 40 this year, so I've been sharing 40 of my favorite films. Favorite films. Favorite. Before everybody jumps in the comments and goes, Oh my god, he's such a hack. It's like, yes, this is a film I recognize is more of a guilty pleasure. Uh, I enjoy it. It was released during a certain period of my life uh, where this was fun. This was 2001. I was working in a movie theater. And my experience with this film was I enjoyed the trailers were, looked fun. The movie looked fun. It's point break with cars. I know everything about it. Everything you could say about this film. I get it. Uh, but, you know, it's... It, and it's gone in a really weird and interesting direction. <laughs> um, I don't even think it's the best film in the franchise. Like, technically. But it's the most fun. Because it sticks true to what it actually set out to do. <laughs> to what it, what the initial promise of the film was. Um, this is on Peacock. And because Peacock apparently hates Universal Studios films... They do not like to upload their own audio description. It's kind of bizarre, but I'm going to keep talking about it until they do so. I mentioned this with Jurassic Park. 40 for 40 was intended to have films that were entirely with audio description, but it's not like I'm reviewing, like, kind of D-list titles that may, ever made by Universal Studios that flopped to the box office. Jurassic Park was a major franchise for them. Probably their biggest franchise, if we're being honest. And The Fast and the Furious was a big enough franchise that they made ten of them. But yet, <laughs> it doesn't have audio description. I think uh, the last two do. I think like F9 and uh, Fate of the Furious and maybe Hobbs and Shaw uh, have some level of audio description when they float onto the service. But it doesn't seem to... Even Furious 7 uh, doesn't have audio description on, on Peacock. So... Yeah, what the fuck? So, uh, it's... I, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. These films are difficult to watch without audio description. If I hadn't seen this film, I don't want to admit to how many times I think I've seen Fast and the Furious, but uh, there was only one scene where it was a montage and there was, like, some pretty heavy rock music going, and I was like, I don't remember what this is. I don't remember what happens in this montage. <laughs> But the rest of them, I just remembered them as being racing scenes and them cutting between drivers and showing us, like, their intense faces as they're racing down the road. Uh, you know, the, I got this. When are they going to hit that NOS button? I don't know. Uh, it'd be great to have all that in the audio description, though, to have that those those moments for the people who didn't get to see Fast and the Furious who aren't me and maybe want to watch it for the first time to understand why, what the fuck is up with the hype around this film, you know. Uh, it's kind of a big film. I, I, Peacock is dropping the ball here. Um, but I don't, I don't know if they care. So, anyway. Uh, thanks, the cock, uh, for, again, lack of accessibility. But I do really actually enjoy this. Hey, maybe we would call this a guilty pleasure, I guess? Because it's one that I don't know that I can stand up and, and call it a, a, a great film. Uh, is it's not. Uh, even in my rewatch, I was listening to Jordana Brewster reading her lines, and I was like, God damn it. <laughs> You're a terrible actress. She does this thing, too, that's really funny out of context. Because uh, you know she's driving, but it sounds like they hit a button for her. Like, they recorded her doing it once. And they just, like, she has the same giggle. And she, uh, in the scenes where Mia is driving, there's a couple times where she just kind of giggles. And she's like... <laughs> but it's, like, the same giggle, like, three times. It's exactly the same. I don't think she did a unique giggle. I think they just copy-pasted the same giggle over and over. Um, and it's things like that when you have no visuals to go off of. There's no audio description. And... All you have is just this, this giggle that cuts in, in and around sound effects. And I was like, that's just, sounds like this, 
she's either really good at repeating the exact same giggle or not. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's, there are parts of this, I, I agree, it's, it's a weird film, but there's a lot of it that does right, and that's casting, because everybody who's in this film feels like they should be in this film. There isn't really anybody in this film who you're like, I don't believe you, I don't buy him in this role. Even Paul Walker, it's like you understand why they would pick him for that role. He does kind of come from that Keanu Reeves school of acting where it's like, whoa, I don't understand, man. We gotta race cars. <laughs> like, he kind of comes from that. So it's, it's almost like it's a nod to point break. Like, we have to have somebody in that role um, who feels like they would rather be surfing. But uh, it works for Point Break because Keanu comes off as a surfer. In this film, Paul Walker comes off as a surfer who has to drive cars. So, uh, but he does kind of come off as being somebody who you might pick for something. You know, this is like an undercover. Like, who do you pick to go undercover in a in a racing scene? You wouldn't pick somebody who was polished. You would pick the kid who nobody else would expect uh, made it through detective school, which makes it so funny that Vince throughout the whole film is like, he's a cop. I was like, what about, what about him screams cop to you? <laughs> like, what about him <laughs> screams cop? Because everything about him screams no police force would have hired him. He, <laughs> there's nothing about him <laughs> that screams cop. But Vince is so, he is so distrusting of every, I think he just thinks everybody's a cop. He probably, if there was like a Vince-centric movie, we would just find out that he thinks everybody's a narc. Um, he just suspects everybody. He just goes in McDonald's and he, he goes up to the line. He's like, I want a big neck. Are you, are you a cop? Are you a cop, by the way? I feel like you're a cop working at McDonald's. <laughs> no. No, I'm not a cop, sir. I, I just work at McDonald's just a hero um but uh this has a lot of great little one-liners in it too uh you know things that you still sort of remember today uh that they play back and forth that work really well um you know you you still owe me a 10 second car and then later at the end he's like i owe you a 10 second car and he lets lets him go he's just like go be free uh we need to make a sequel <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, uh, Michelle Rodriguez as Letty, uh, this is a good, it's a good film for her, uh, this is coming in and around the same time she was starting to blow up too, this is a film that kind of launched a thousand ships, uh, cause her career kind of got bigger coming out of this, it's also around the same time she got the part in Resident Evil, uh, she had just done Girl Fight, the indie boxing drama where she got a lot of critical acclaim for actually acting. Uh, for those who don't know that Michelle Rodriguez ever actually acted. Even Jordana Brewster had been in some other things. She was in The Faculty, um, just among some other roles. So it was a conglomeration of these people that were on the rise at the time. And putting them together in a film directed by Brian Robbins, the guy that directed varsity blues which kind of i guess explains the paul walker casting um just made sense so yes uh i love this film i also it gave me an opportunity because i haven't seen fast x yet and it gave me an opportunity to go back through sometimes i like to go back through and talk about where the other films are before fast x it also gave me an opportunity to talk about why the hell peacock refuses to put audio description on their own universal titles. These are titles that they own. So it'd be like if Disney refused to put titles on Disney movies on Disney Plus, but they had, like, the, but they were like, but our Disney Plus originals have audio description. It's like, the fuck are you doing with your library? You know, like, what? what's going on with your library, though? You have a giant catalog of films. Are you going to do anything with that? <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what Universal's doing with Peacock. Is if you if you look at the 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 list for audio description, go to adp.acb.org, audio description project, American House of the Blind. That's what it stands for. I'm not sending you to some weird piracy website. Um, and uh, you'll see a list of titles currently offered to Peacock, and you'll see how 
few of those movies are Universal titles that were released prior to the existence of Peacock. The, the movies there are pretty much movies that were released in the last couple of years. And then if you want to watch anything that was made before the existence of Peacock and is a universal title, good luck. So uh, it doesn't matter how big the film was. Like they don't have audio description for Jaws. I don't know what's up with that. You know, I mean, these are films that they build rides for. <laughs> that they won't put audio description tracks on. There is a ride, by the way, for Fast and the Furious at Universal Studios, at least here in Florida. So uh, there's another reason why it's why I, I demand audio description for this film, fuckers. Um, yeah, I enjoy it. It's, it, I can't put this as, uh, I don't, I've been giving all my 40 for 40s A pluses and I did give a, I did give Kindergarten Cop an A plus. I don't know if it's an A plus movie, but these are just to signify. Usually, when I give a film an A plus, it's me acknowledging my bias and saying this film has achieved a, a level for me in which it's, it's rewatchable. I've seen it a ton of times. I don't. It doesn't degrade for me. This film is twenty two years old, and you would think that it would feel a little old in the tooth, <laughs> but it didn't for me. Even without audio description, I didn't feel like, I was like, oh, wow, this film hasn't aged well. I was like, this is still a fun film. It's still structured well. They set up multiple potential villains so that that way you at least have the hope that maybe Dominic is not the guy. <laughs> I mean, Johnny Tran is set up to be a decently, pos a decent possibility. Maybe it is him. There's the the Latina guy that comes in and orders the, the exact parts for three cars. That's a total possibility as well. You know what I mean? It sets up the it sets up these other possibilities, but um, it's uh, obviously we know where the franchise goes and keeps going and going and going and going. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Ah, it's a film that inspired every driver to leave my parking lot at the movie theater that night and peel out. It, it made everybody into a street racer. Everybody, it didn't matter. People, it didn't matter what the vehicle. I, I used to, I could see out in the parking lot, the way our concession stand in this space was faced into a, like a glass window and I could see the front parking lot. It didn't matter what the car was. You'd be driving a minivan and you'd pull, like, people were like backing up and then, <laughs> just like, Oh, I wonder what movie they saw. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was infectious. Uh, it was a really weird phenomenon, but it was one. And I'm going to give The Fast and the Furious, I'm going to give it an A+. Don't kill me. That's the point of my 40 for 40, is me being really honest about films that I love. Uh, they don't always have to be good films. There are plenty of films that I have seen over the years that I have not wanted to rewatch. I've never rewatched 12 Years a Slave. I think it's a fantastic movie. I think the work in the, and the craft in that film is amazing. I have no desire to ever rewatch that film. Uh, what Lupita Nyong'o goes through in that film uh, is just, it's, it's an experience unto itself. Uh, and she absolutely deserved that Academy Award. And, and uh, I'm not one for continuously reliving that as my entertainment. I don't consider that to be entertainment. I watched it. I saw it. It was good. It was fantastic. It deserved all the praise. The actors did great work. However, that's not going to be a 40 for 40 mo for mo movie for me. Because it's not something that I would put on to just feel better about my life. <laughs> if somebody would do that, I would be concerned. <laughs> I would be deeply concerned as to why somebody enjoyed watching that film over and over and over. <laughs> um, so, anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I do have a website, MacTheMovieGuy.com. You can go to the audio description project, adp.acv.org. Like I said earlier, and I'll tell you what has audio description and where you can watch it. 
and you can go to the adna.org, that's the adna.org, and you can look up narrators there for films when they do actually have narration. And you can go to Twitter or Instagram. I'm not on threads yet. I need to get on that threads, right? Threads. Is it going to be a thing? Are we going to make it a thing? Anyway, uh, but I'm on the first two, and you can follow me at Mac the Movie Guy. So, that's it for now. Uh, I live my life a quarter mile at a time, so I will see you guys in the next quarter mile.